but I'm also curious how deep it goes because I see so many comments from so many politicians and people with power in the context of the U.S. where I feel like they have to have something on you. When Lindsey Graham comes out there and talks about nuking Gaza, says we should do the Hiroshima and Nagasaki solution, and he's just one of many. I've seen a number of people floating nuking Gaza. I've seen a number of people defend every action from the IDF, not even, you know, when you look at the details, it's, it blows your mind how many instances of various war crimes there have been. How deep does that rock go? Because even when you look at somebody like Trump, Trump, right, he comes out there and goes to the right of Biden on the issue of Gaza and says, actually, Biden's pro-Hamas and he's pro-terrorist and he's not pro-Israel enough and I'll be even more pro-Israel. And it's like, do they have dirt on some large percentage even of U.S. politicians that they can then bring up? Or is it ideological and financial in the sense that it's corruption as well? Yeah, RFK Jr. is another one that RFK comes to Jr. Mind. is another one I thought, they got to have something on him. Um, here, you have to make fine, F-I-N-E, fine delineations and distinctions. I think you're right. It can be one of several things. One could be ideological. Right. They identify with the Jewish supremacist state because they're white supremacists. So mm -hmm. there's a kind of instinctive sense of a common cause. Mm -hmm. A second is, well, we know financial contributions make a difference as to whether you win or lose an election. And uh, the Israel lobby is very well organized uh, and very wealthy lots of money. That's not a surprise. It comes as a surprise only to those who want to be surprised. Anybody mm. who knows the record will not be surprised. And then there is the issue of dirt. Uh, right now, it's not considered, um, it's not considered proper to acknowledge the extent to which a lot of what's happening uh, is due to the power of money of Jewish supremacists. I don't believe they are Zionists. I, I don't think they really give a darn about Israel. That's my view. Um, there was a very famous social commentator. I didn't like his politics, but he once said his name was Irving Howe from a previous generation. And Irving Howe once commented, if you have enough money in your pocket for a one-way ticket to Israel, and you didn't purchase it, you're not a Zionist. And I think that was factually correct. Anybody who understood what it meant to be a Zionist, uh, if you didn't purchase that one-way ticket to Israel, uh, you're not a Zionist. Uh, so I don't believe most of these people are in any meaningful sense Zionists. They're Jewish supremacists. And Jewish supremacists means two things. It means, first of all, Jews can do no wrong. So, uh, you're holding Jews to a standard that's false. Jews do no wrong. And secondly, if they do wrong, the fact that you're focusing on them is because you must be an anti-Semite. Otherwise, why aren't you talking about, you know, China? And why aren't you talking about the Kurds? And why aren't you talking about... They cannot accept the possibility that Israel, A, is doing wrong, and B, people are outraged because of the wrong that's being committed. It always has to be something else. It could be uh, anti-Semitism, or as most Jews believe, it's envy. That if you, if you have vent an animus towards what Israel is doing, it's because you envy Jews. You're jealous of Jews. Jews are better. That's, you know, the bottom line, Jews are better. The Goyim envy Jews. And that's why they'll use things like Gaza to discredit us. It can never be that we're doing something wrong. That cannot be be a possibility. And even if we're doing something wrong, well, so does everybody else do wrong. So why are you focusing on us? You're focusing on us because you're an anti-Semite and you're an anti-Semite because you're jealous of us. Believe me, I grew up in that milieu. I understand that milieu. I'll even acknowledge. Sometimes I reflexively react that way myself. Hmm. It's um, a Jewish reflex 
to, to rule out the possibility that the reason people may be outraged is because of the wrong that's being done. It can only be because you're an anti-Semite or because you envy us. You're jealous of us because we're better and we've established the fact that we're better. We won percentage, 25% of the Nobel prizes, even though we represent 0.002% of the world population. Uh, Marx, all the great figures of modernity, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Albert Einstein, they were all Jewish. And look, when you grew up in that milieu, you know all of that, and it's deeply entrenched in your psyche. So uh, right now, you're not allowed to say it, but a large amount of what's going on in the public scene, it's just the money issue. When all the college presidents came um, and stamped out all of the encampments, it was obvious what was going on. As you recall, it all began when members of the Jewish billionaire class went after the U of P, went after Harvard, and threatened to withhold by any reckoning significant sums of money. $50 million here, $100 million there. That's not small change. Even for billionaires, it's not small change. And if you remember at Harvard, they then, the Jewish alumni presented a petition to Harvard. It was about 1,200 signatories threatening to withhold money. And so uh, all of the institutions began to cave in to that financial pressure that was being exerted. You have to remember, there's only one role of a college president. College presidents have one role, fundraising. That's their job. Their job is to fundraise. And now they're being told that these huge sums in alumni money, uh, earmarked for their endowment, are going to be withheld. Now, what do you want to call that? Do you want to call that corruption? Do you want to call that bribery? Do you want to call that um, whatever name you want to attach? But obviously, uh, something, let's just call it, uh, something sordid is going on when principles of academic freedom and freedom of speech are being uh, grossly, egregiously violated by virtue of the power of money. And yeah. it reached a point, as both of you know, when uh, even Eric Adams, the current mayor of New York, was in consultation with this Jewish billionaire class and being told, you have to crush these demonstrations. It was obvious to me, as you can imagine, at my age, I've attended many a demonstration. And it was obvious in New York, the city was beginning to look like an armed camp. Hmm. I was just shocked at the number of cops that were out in the streets for each demonstration. I would say at certain points, not all points, but at certain points, it had to be two to one, two cops for every demonstrator. Jesus, that's like, crazy. What, what, what is going on here? And then it became clear what was going on here. Eric Adams had been, Eric Adams is not a, the most popular guy in the block right now. <laughs> very corrupt yeah. and he's very inept. Yeah. And the New York Times and other media outlets were writing very negative stories about him and his re-election is coming up i can't remember now when exactly it is but he was given notice that they wouldn't support him and when the upper east side doesn't support you it's going to be very hard for you to become mayor of new york that's just the way it works in our city well it's trump is a very illustrative illustrative example as well i'm sure you saw this report that he went into a room of um 
uh, New York billionaires and promised them that he would crush the protest. He's, his quote was, I think, I'll, I'll set that movement back 30 years, promise to deport any, um, any protesters that he could who were pro-Palestinian. And, you know, I don't think Trump, like, is really a Zionist. Like, I, I don't think he has an ideological belief on it. It's purely transactional for him. But yeah, for him, it's very clear, like, oh, this is this is what they want to hear. This is what I need to do to raise the money. And so this is exactly where I'm going to be. I'm going to get to the right of Joe Biden somehow and be even more pro-Israel and anti-Palestinian than he is. Yeah, I think that's a factor in Biden's current stand. That Biden, there is a, a strategic interest that the U.S. has in the Middle East, and I have no doubt that it plays a significant role in the decision making of the Biden administration, Biden, um, um, Blinken, uh, Sullivan, and others. But I do also believe there's a financial element. Namely, there is a fear. Uh, if, you've, if you've ever followed the work of this guy, A. Thomas Ferguson, uh, he basically he had, he wrote a famous book called The Golden Rule. And the golden rule basically was whichever side in the presidential election gets more campaign contributions always wins. And that's just an iron rule of our elections. Whoever has the largest war chest going into uh, November is going to win. And I think there was a very, there is, not was, there is a very real fear by Biden that this Jewish supremacist, Jewish supremacist billionaire class, they'll switch sides. Uh, there's already rumors that Ackman, William Ackman, um, who led the charge at Harvard, he might switch to Trump. And there have been articles, I'm just reporting what the press reports. Right. Um, uh, and there are reports that there's uh, pressure being put on, say, people like Biden by Chaim Sabin, who's a big figure in the Democratic Party, very close to the Clintons, yeah. about standing firm on Israel. So yeah. there is a real concern now. And it puts limits on Biden because he's afraid of losing that money. Uh, and it's very possible that he will lose that money if he makes any kind of principled stand, takes a principled stance on what's happening.